Thank you, Freddie. Um, Suzanne, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, thank you so much, Michelle. Um, so yes, I'm so, so, so grateful and excited to be here with um, uh, Dr. Carolyn Finney and Dr. Michelle Best. Um, my name is Suzanne Pierre. I am a biogeochemist and ecosystems ecologist focused on the ways that um, social motivations and social oppression systems are related to ecology and elemental cycles. Um, I am the director of the Critical Ecology Lab, a research nonprofit focused on what I just described. Um, and I'm also a visiting scholar at UC Berkeley and an Osher Fellow at the Cal Academy, California Academy of Sciences. Sorry, let me use my words. Um, thank you so much. And I'll pass it back to you, Michelle. Thanks, Sue. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. And thank you so much for being here. I think a number of you appreciated our earlier conversation and hopefully we will have as rich a conversation as that for the rest of this session. Um, I am the a professor and the current chair of the Department of Recreation and Tourism Management at CSUN. I've been on this campus for over 12 years and we have engaged in a number of exciting opportunities that we offer to our students and I'm really happy that our department was able to be a part of this opportunity that we are offering today to give voice to you know what so much of what so much of us are feeling but to really explore this relationship that people of african descent in the us and and elsewhere have with land and nature and, and some concerns that we have and so on i am um, if you've read any part of my bio you will see that i am a proud Bajan and from barbados and the caribbean uh, you may hear an accent, the more excited I get, the stronger that accent becomes, so you may hear some of it coming through today. And so my connection to the to land and nature is in some ways different to the connection with African Americans in this country, but also in some ways similar. I am an outdoors person. I, I would love to have this conversation outside if we were taking a hike or, you know, just sitting under a tree somewhere it would be so much nicer. Instead, I, I'm kind of forced to do it indoors and, and that's okay too, but at least we're having the conversation. It is a real honor for me to be able to introduce Dr. Carolyn Finney. Um, and it's, it's funny because I've used several chapters of a remarkable book, Black Faces, White Spaces, in my graduate level sustainable tourism class. And I think I have a couple of my former students who are in the audience today who re may remember the conversations and interventions about um, people of African descent and other people of color and how they interact with and how they are appreciated in the natural environment and, and what that looks like. Uh, Carolyn Finney is a storyteller, an author, and a cultural um, geographer. She's deeply interested in issues related to identity, to identity, different creativity, and resilience. She's grounded in both artistic and intellectual ways of knowing, having pursued an uh, acting career for 11 years, and I'm, I'm curious about what I can go look at to see her in. Um, <laughs> but five years of backpacking trips through Africa and Asia and living in Nepal changed the courses of her life. And, and if I can just interject here, my dissertation chair at the University of Florida was from Nepal. And, Nepal. and so we have even more connections than we yeah. realized, you know, five minutes ago. Yes. Uh, motivated by these experiences, Carolyn returned to school after a 15 year absence to complete a BA, MA, and later on a PhD. We, we are also connected through the fact that we are both Fulbright scholars and I have an added pleasure of introducing a sister Fulbright scholar to you, uh, along with public speaking, writing, media engagement, consulting and teaching. She has served on the US National Parks Advisory Board for eight years. And her first book, which I mentioned before, Black Spaces, White Spaces, Reimagining the Relationship of African Americans to the Great Outdoors was released in 2014. I am really so proud and so honored to introduce Dr. Carolyn Finney to speak with you here today. Thank you. Wow, that was a great introduction. I should have taped it. Then, you know, I play it every morning when I get up. You know, uh, it would be fabulous. Um, thank you. Uh, I was going to say Dr. Suzanne and Dr. Michelle uh, for 
being here today. I want to let everybody know if I, and so just the format that I was told I should speak for maybe about 30 minutes, not take up too much space, but just putting some more juice on the table. Though, frankly, I don't know that the three of us need any more juice on the table. And then we're going to have a conversation and also invite people from the audience to ask questions about that. So um, thank you. Okay, thank you, Stevie Ruiz. Thank you to CSUN. Thank you to, I think, Rutgers. Thank you to everyone who um, made it possible for me to be with you. And like I've been saying a lot, thank you for coming to my living room in my apartment in Burlington, Vermont. It's so great to see you here. I can't believe y'all can fit in here. Um, so I'm going to, I always have to show some slides because I'm a sucker for imagery and it kind of, you know, gives people something to look at um, besides me. And and I was kind of picking and choosing some of these things I've said before and been saying a lot recently, but a, a few things that I wanted to put out there. And one of my friends has said to me when I was talking about, you know, 2020, I don't mean to be rude, but 2020 is a bitch. Let's just be real about it for a second. It's a, it's a year and it ain't even over yet. It ain't even over. And she reminded me, she's in her 70s, you know, that, you know, 2020 is also the idea of 2020 vision. Maybe this is a moment where we can see more clearly about a lot of issues about race, about the environment, about our politics, about who, about democracy, about place, just so many issues are on the table yet again, right, for us to kind of look at and decide how we want to move forward with that. So I've sort of been taking that with me as I think about it. Now, I'm always looking for an excuse because I love science fiction, horror, you know, movies. I'm a sucker for it. How can I bring this in? And this is an easy one. So it may seem like to some of you that I'm going off somewhere on a riff, but I am, but not really. So I won't give any spoilers here, but I love the HBO series Lovecraft Country, man. I was all about it all day long. I was sad when it ended. Um, and here why I think it is relevant. What really got me most excited about it is kind of giving you a brief synopsis without giving anything away. It focuses, it's like around the 1940s, 1950s during Jim Crow segregation. I believe it centers in Chicago. The central characters are all African-American. There are some white characters, there's some Korean characters, um, and I say Korean, not Korean American, but there's some Korean characters, but the primary, and there's even an indigenous character, but the primary characters are African American. And it is like a mixture of Indiana Jones and um, Tomb Raider and every horror film you see, there's actual ugly monsters with, you know, big teeth and there's witches and magic and there's time travel and, you know, it is all over the place, right? The thing that was so powerful for me in one of the early episodes, because it's focused on Black people who are this extended family who live together and they're going to go on this driving adventure from Chicago to Massachusetts to find these white people who are maybe family and witches and all this stuff is going to happen. When they're about to get on the road and climb into their car, right, the, the matriarch of a family, she's not going to come with them, but they're packing up their car, they're laughing, they're nervous, they're excited, the way that people get about adventures. And she's pulled out her list and says, let's just make sure you, you got everything you need. And she's kind of going down her checklist because she's kind of following that whole thing about the green book. The idea that if you are Black and traveling at this time, even if you're going on the greatest adventure of all time that no one will ever believe you because they're going to be monsters and all these things are going to happen, you still better make sure you have what you need because you are not going to be able to stop in any hotel or restaurant, just any hotel or restaurant on the road. So you just got to know. But she was doing it almost nonchalantly. It was like, it wasn't the point of the story. But it was very clear and explicit that this is part of the story. Later on, you see them driving. Um, <clears throat> it's starting to get dark. They get pulled over by a white state trooper. There's the kind of exchange that we've all come to expect because we've either, either seen it or experienced it ourselves. You're nervous. What's going to happen? And, you know, and he's telling them that you have about seven minutes because this is a sundown town, something that's real in our history. And if you're Black and you're in this town, then... <clears throat> You may not make it back to where you, you know, where you want to go alive, right? So they're looking on getting out. You see these experiences. Then you also see them in the woods and, and there's these monsters like, whoo, coming out with ugly teeth and all that happens. For me, what was so powerful about this is not just the monsters from the woods that they were seeing, but the everyday monsters that they face in real life, the everyday horrors that exist in real life. 
And it didn't actually diminish who they were all as whole people that were resilient, excited, courageous, brave, foolish, all the things that people do when they're on adventures, and you're watching horror movies and you're going, ah, you know, you know, everything is happening. But the main characters are black. So the point of view, the perspective, the centering of the story is around blackness. It doesn't deny whiteness and other forms of being. But it actually, it's like taking a prism and it's been turned to say, yes, all those other things exist, but what do they look like when they exist? And the primary view is this one, not just a black point of view, but a human point of view by people who happen to be black. And so I really, I mean, it blew me away because it's so, it seems like nothing. And for me, it was everything about storytelling and what narratives we privilege and who we privilege as being at the center of it. And one of the things for me about the mainstream environmental movement in the United States and the history of conservation is not that I think there's anything inherently wrong with many of the stories that are told. It's just all the stories that are never told. So those other stories are made to be the universal story for the rest of us, denying us our presence, our experience, our perspective, and actually accountability. And I mean accountability by others because of whiteness and the way whiteness is centered. And I say this, as I always say, whiteness is not a bad thing. For me, it's like Baldwin says, it's whiteness is about power. Nobody can help the skin they were born in, but let's be clear about this country for the last 400 years. What has been privileged here in terms of the perspective, also understanding that whiteness is quite diverse, like we know that. And there's a way within which it has been centered in every sector of our lives, including the environment. One of the other things that I wanna say, and I know that Stevie said, please, please tell the story, and I always do, is for me, what I call the subjectivity of perspective, right? That we all have, we are, for me, we're all subjective. All knowledge is subjective. We bring our perspective to bear upon anything it is we're trying to understand, right? And so part of it is, is whose perspective is privileged. But also I always question my own positionality, the way that I'm situated, the fact that I'm biased. Everybody on this call is biased. And bias is not the same as prejudices and racism, but man, it exists. Like it's there in the room, right? And it can run them up as well if you're not clear about what that is. And it influences power dynamics. So for me, this is personal. When people ask me, you know, well, are you going to have to give a lecture? Is this going to be an intellectual conversation? And I said, you know, I got all my degrees. I got my bona fides. I can have that conversation. But what I would be denying is the fact that this is personal. It's personal, it's political, and it's intimate. Right. And there's no either no hierarchy there for me. It is all blended together. And I actually think that should be true for everyone. And I actually think it is true, but we can have that conversation right about what that looks like. So I've got to tell you a little bit about <clears throat> and some of you may have heard me tell this story before, because it's the story that I tell about where I got my perspective. And I'll try to keep it as brief as possible. Um, these are my story on uh, my parents. Henry and Rose. Uh, Henry and Rose, this is from the 1950s, that picture. They grew up in Floyd, Virginia, which is, at, you know, near the Blue Ridge Mountains. They grew up very poor. <clears throat> you know, as Oprah used to say, there's poor and Poe, and my parents were Poe. Uh, high school education, um, both in really big families in the same little town. Uh, my father went off to fight in the Korean War. When he came back from that fight, um, he told me that he saw a, a park ranger in a park ranger uniform and, he, and it looked like a great government job. And he went to apply for it in the state of Virginia. And what they told him was, I'm sorry, we don't hire Negroes. So my parents, like a lot of black people in the South, migrated North. So I was part of the great migration. They went to New York thinking he might have, and it was he might have better job opportunities, right? Not my mother. And so he had two job offers. One, he could be a janitor in Syracuse, New York, which is five hours North of New York City. Or the other, which is the job he ended up taking, was 30 minutes outside New York City in Westchester County. There was a 12-acre estate owned by a very wealthy Jewish family who owned a lot of real estate at the time, and they needed full-time caretakers for the estate. They needed someone to be a chauffeur, a gardener, someone to be a partial housekeeper. So this is the jobs that my parents took. Um, the, the, the house you're seeing in this picture is actually the gardener's cottage where I grew up in where my parents lived. Um, so there are two houses on this property. The uh, owner would only come up generally on weekends and holidays. 
my parents moved into this house in around, I think, 57. Uh, they tried to have kids, thought they couldn't have kids, so they then adopted me. And I was actually like six months old when they adopted me. And then what I always say is they relaxed and had my first brother, Greg. And a few years after that, there was more relaxing happening. And they had my second brother, Marcus, or as he likes to go by now, John. He's a grown man, but I still call him Marcus. So we were living in this neighborhood, all white, incredibly wealthy. Harry Winston had property down the street. Schaefer of Schaefer Beer was next door. Winkle Golf Club was around the corner. We were the only family of color in this neighborhood until the 90s. Japanese American woman moved in. After a few years, she moved out. Um, the story that I tell people, oh, well, before I say that, and I want to say we were out playing outside all the time. Me and my brothers knew how to swim by the time we were six or seven because there was a swimming pool on this property, a small pond with fish in it on this property, vegetable gardens, fruit trees, a very long driveway. You can see that there's three pictures here that give um, an image of that. I've kind of interspersed it with a, an old picture or painting of people picking cotton because I think there's that history, especially for my parents, is embedded very particularly in their experience on this estate. So we were outdoors people. Now, much like Michelle, I mean, part of me is really much grounded in that non-human nature in a very particular way. And I didn't even understand to what degree until I got older to really reflect back on it. But the other story that I tell is when I was nine years old, we went to a public school and we could often walk home from that public school in Mamaroneck. And there were always policemen patrolling this neighborhood in their cars, white policemen. And I was right around the corner from the house, so fourth grade, school bag, time of day, coming home from school. And I was almost at the driveway, and a policeman stopped me. I, he, he was in his car. He asked me where I was going, and I gave him the address, and I said, a thousand old White Plains Road. And he looked at me, and he said, oh, do you work there? And you know, when you're nine, you're kind of like, what? And I just remember all I said, no, I live there. And he started to say, oh, okay. And he let me go. I go home, I tell my parents, my father calls the police station, he gives them hell. They never bother me or my brothers again. But as an adult, and this is a common story for a lot of people, I'm sure um, you've either heard it or experienced yourself. I have to think about the logics there. Like I, I was a little girl, time of day, school bag, you know, pretty harmless, <laughs> you know. But I started to think about that as I got older in terms of, are you telling me that it's not natural for me and my family because of the color of skin to be in this beautiful outdoor space in this way? I wanna jump ahead very quickly to the 90s. So the matriarch and patriarch, the people who owned um, this property, the patriarch had died years earlier. The matriarch at this point was very sick and started to question what's gonna to happen to my parents. Me and my brothers have, by the 90s, we've moved out, we're older. Um, my parents have been caring for the land at that point around 40 years. To the, to the matriarch's credit, she wanted to try to keep my parents on this land. This land was worth over $3 million at the time. Property taxes were over $125,000 a year. My, pa my father had been making something like $25,000 a year, so it wasn't happening. <clears throat> at the end of the day, she had a house built for them in Leesburg, Virginia. And the reason it was Leesburg, because at that point, my youngest brother was married with kids and he was settled there. I was moving around, as was my other brother. So they moved back to Leesburg. When the matriarch died, she had my father by her bedside. It's, it's, it, that relationship is really complicated. Um, she passed away, the new owner came on, but my parents still had to stay on for another few years because they always need to have somebody here caring for this land full time. So they stayed on to 2003. Now they've been caring for this land for nearly 50 years, just about, right? They got there around 57, so it's 2003. The new owner found a family from the Dominican Republic who moved in, and so my parents finally left. In 2003 was when I was working on my PhD, and I had been very focused on for a while on gender and environment conservation issues in Nepal. But because this was happening in my family, it was personal, I started thinking about race, and very particularly about African Americans and environmental issues in the United States. <clears throat> but at that time, at Clark University, there was no African-American studies class. There was no department. There's a lot of reasons why initially I didn't do it. But because I, I was on my Fulbright in Nepal and could not do what I needed to do there because there was political unrest in the country, I tried. I went there. It was 2001. That's its own whole story. I hung in there for seven months but couldn't do my research. I came back and wrote a whole new research proposal on African-Americans and the environment. The last thing that I want to say to you about this is I watched my father in particular get depressed. My mother, you know, deals with dep depression off and on in general, but my father doesn't, and he really did. And he talked about missing the land. 
And both of them were talking about how they had no land to leave us. So this idea of legacy, right? And no matter how many times we said, you've, left, you've given us so much and all this, you know, they couldn't let that go. They received a copy of a letter from one of their old neighbors, from the old neighborhood, this old neighborhood you're looking at here. And I have a copy of the letter. It was from the Westchester Land Trust. It had images of the estate on there. And they wanted to let everybody know in the neighborhood that a conservation easement had been now placed on this piece of property. That means in perpetuity, nothing can be changed. And it talked about why. It talked about the wildlife on the property. It talked about where it sits in the watershed and the importance of that. It talked about all the uh, animals, you know, the flora and fauna that were on the property, why it was important to protect it. At the end of the letter, which is about a page and a half long, the land trust thanked the new owner for his conservation mindedness. He'd been on the land for about three years. There was nothing in the letter thanking my parents who'd cared for that land for nearly 50 years. And just that fast, I saw how people can be erased from history. And not because the people at the land trust are bad people, but that's often how privilege operates. I always say privilege has the privilege of not seeing itself, not necessarily making them bad, but man, when you can live in a world where you don't actually have to think beyond your own experience because your own experience is normalized as central to everyone else's experience, you can easily overlook the fact that the people who cared for the land and knew it better than anybody else for 50 years aren't, isn't important to the story. And so that's where I start. I came to this, I came to that book, I've come to everything since then, in part is, you know, only recently understanding that that's their legacy. They're, it's their life and it's their story. And for me, everybody's story has value. This is the driveway that now has a big gate on it that you have to get permission to get in. It wasn't there when we moved in. Um, and so when I, when we have, for me, when we have a conversation about conservation in the United States and we talk about things like public lands, I, when we say public lands, what public are we talking about? You know, and also what land are we talking about, right? <laughs> you know, because if I remember correctly, Christopher Columbus lost his way and then got here and misnamed the place. And there were all these people who've been living here, not for 50 years or 100 years, but I would say on this continent, a few thousand years had already been here, right? So yeah, you know, I had to go there a little bit anyway. So there's something about what I like to say, this moment of convergence that's always been here. We've always had moments of convergence. When people talk about the urgency of this moment around um, the environment, I want to say, uh, and race, and systemic racism that for many people and for many non-human entities, it has always been urgent. <laughs> urgent, 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 you know, for 400 years. This country in many, the many ideals this country is built on, and some of them I am, I want to be really clear, I am really grateful this is the place I was born into. I have a strong belief in the project of democracy. The idea of it is incredibly appealing to me. And here's the thing, this country was built on two things that we don't like to talk about, okay? One, it was, all this land was stolen. All this land was stolen. And we either killed or removed people in order to get that land and call it public lands. Two, we built the backbone of our economy on a group of people that we basically robbed you know, from their own place, you know, with the help of some of the people from where they were from, let's be clear, right? And we forced them to work the land and build the backbone of our economy for free. And then over the next, what well, I don't know, a couple hundred years, I, I really lost count at this point, we've dehumanized their presence, who they are over and over and over again. So when I think about this moment and the uniqueness of human beings like George Floyd being murdered in full view. It's unique that he is murdered. It is not unique that a black person is murdered for no other reason than simply being black. Ah, oh, we can go back to the Fugitive of Slave Laws and talk about like that. So I'm not even gonna go there, but there's nothing unique in that way about this moment. I put all these images up here in part, right? Because we're talking about environment and conservation. You can see Japanese internment, enslavement, um, immigrants, poor people, the environment, toxic waste, and also the black and white images of Gifford Pinchot who founded the Forest Service and 
really the idea of conservation as a way to, as in terms of thinking about how we manage our resources for our use. And this famous image of John Muir and President Roosevelt, 1903, of the Yosemite National Park overhanging rock. And I focus on Muir a lot and Roosevelt for a lot of different reasons, because in part I wonder, yeah, I, I, I wonder at the conversation they were having and how powerful that was. And I want to be really clear here. I don't, I don't have to diminish them in order to make my story fuller, right? But that doesn't mean I can't be critical of their privilege and their place and the choices they made coming up with ideas like wilderness. I think a lot of it was embedded in some really solidly um, good, good ideas, actually, or at least thought, philosophical thought about you know, what is not us, right? What is out there? How do we protect? How do we project it? You know, what do we do about that? What is our relationship? I can't fault them for wanting to have that conversation. Where that kind of falls off a little bit for me, <laughs> there's a lot of places where it falls off. And one of them is I have to think, so 1903, what was happening like around that time, right? You know, for everybody else, right? And I always go back to 1862, because I think it's really nice to take 40 or 50 years and look at it in a span to try to understand what was happening. What's the context? 1862, the Homestead Act. Gun goes off at midnight. For the, for the most part, if you're a, of European descent, you can run out on the land, you can put your stake down on 160 acres. And if you can, you can stay on that for five years, if you build a home, if you farm or garden, that land is yours free and clear. And I say it like that every time because I'm like, that's tremendous. I don't believe anybody in the world has given you 160 acres just because you ran out on it, put your stake down, and then said, I just got to last for five years. And the other thing that I always say about it is not simply about land. It is about economic and political power. It is about legacy. And it's about the right to be able to say you belong. How many of us today can't say that about this country? Because this country reminds us over and over again in subtle and not so subtle ways that many of us don't belong. Unless we assimilate, we can have that conversation. So, <laughs> um, European Americans, 160 acres, getting that land. Now, I don't like to diminish the experience of Europeans, people of European descent, because many of them didn't want to leave where they were coming from. They were having issues over land. Many of them were poor and starving. I can't imagine the kind of risk and courage it took to come to a place that they had no idea what is going on over here, right? There was no social media, man. They just have to take the risk and take in a leap to come across the ocean to do it. I can't fault them for that, right? We're human. We move. Those are the things we do. The thing that I have to ask, right, and also I want to say that something like 60% of them didn't survive. They got their 160 acres, but they died because they could die from the flu. They could die from loneliness. They could die from so many things, right, at that time. So the risk was huge for them to do that. But I still have to ask who was on that land before they got there, who had to be removed and or killed in order for that land to be made available. Three years later, Emancipation Proclamation, enslaved Africans are freed. They're giving 400,000 acres until white plantation owners said, oh my God, we just gave people that we've enslaved 400,000 acres of land. And land isn't about, just about land, it's about economic and political power. And they took all that land back. And while you have some African-American homesteaders, for the most part, they were not allowed to participate in the Homestead Act to the same degree that people of European descent did. So we don't even have to say anymore, all this is happening while Muir and Roosevelt are having a conversation. Oh, and I forgot to mention Jim Crow segregation that went in around 1890, around that time, that if you were non-white, and in particular, if you were Black, there are places you couldn't go. And the environment and non-human nature and our parks and our wild places were not immune to that. There was no magic dust around that if you stepped into a park, it didn't count. Jim Crow didn't count. <laughs> Jim Crow counted everywhere in this country and probably in a few places that we didn't even know that it counted. Because I think some places it was really explicit with sundown towns and whites only. And in other places, right, it wasn't so clear. Um, yeah, I could go on about that, but I'm going to stop there for a minute. Uh, I, I love this with I love James Baldwin and I love the quote, not everything that can, that, not everything that can 
that his face can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it's faced. So there's something for me about looking at the past in a very particular way at this moment, not living in the past, but understanding we're living in the legacy of that moment. Um, how am I doing for time? So this is where I decide which stories I'm going to do. How, I'm not even paying attention. How am I doing for time? You're, you're good on time. Mm -hmm. Okay. I got some time. Okay. We're, we're only about uh, 30 minutes in. But I, have I been talking for 30 minutes? No, you have not. Okay. So, so we, you probably have like another 15 to 20 minutes. Okay, perfect. Okay, good. And I, I'll try not to take that whole thing, actually. Um, I was, I often share this and I was going to skip it today, but I actually, I always want to, add, you know, add this because these are not my words and the experience of Vanessa Garrison in thinking about, you know, and we all know this, but I think it bears worth repeating that, yes, I was talking about things that happened in the past, but this shows up when we have conversations about the environment, who's can, who belongs to a space, who can show up and engage in the outdoors in a very particular way. This was about two years ago, and she posted this on Facebook to those, that know, those of us who are, were friends with her on Facebook. And Vanessa Garrison and Morgan Dixon started the largest nonprofit in the country that focused on Black women health. It's Girl Trek. They started in, in 2012. And it was really about getting Black women in the outdoors, walking, hiking, you know, enjoying those health benefits that I think are there for everyone, but we can't always all access them in the same way. And they had just taken a group of women to Rocky Mountain National Park in Colorado. And this is what she posted, you know, after she'd come off the mountain that day. She said, when I, when I have more time to clear my head, I'm going to write a longer piece about being pulled over in the national park while I was driving a band full of black women down the mountain after experiencing a magical hike together. I'm going to tell you about the park police officer who approached my van with his hand on his gun and demanded I roll down the back window so he could see who's inside. I'm going to tell you how he accused me of being drunk, asked me what I was doing in the park, and then told me if I cooperated, he wouldn't give me a ticket. A ticket for what, I asked. Driving too close to the car in front of you. That's a crime in Colorado. I led three advanced hikes over the course of three days this last weekend. I've personally brought hundreds of Black women to Rocky Mountain National Park over the past four years. I've organized trips at every park in the country, inspired thousands of more to take a step into the great outdoors. I was on the cover of Outside Magazine. I started a Christmas commercial for REI. I partnered with the Sierra Club to train outdoor trip leaders, was named a Yosemite National Park ambassador, and yet this man was asking me what I was doing in the park. Asked me while still holding his hand to his gun, despite seeing our hiking gear when we rolled the windows down. Asked me what I was doing there, as if he wasn't standing on stolen land, and I was somehow trespassing. This is why I turned down opportunities to speak on diversity and inclusion in the outdoors. No, I don't wanna be on your panel. Nope, I don't wanna write an article or give a quote. No, I don't believe that things are changing. Diversity and inclusion? How about decolonization and reparations? When you wanna talk about that, I'll be ready. In the meantime, we'll be back to the park next year. Thinking we'll bring a thousand black women this time, Thinking I'll pack a fried chicken sandwich and wrap it in foil and then eat it at the lake next time because I can. Thinking I'll listen to some Tupac while I take in the views. Thinking I'll do whatever I want because I can, because I have a right to be there, because you won't scare us off. I belong here. We belong here. So we can talk about that later, but I just wanted to drop that in. Um, this is, I call this my metaphorical Afro, and I always sort of place this in here as like all of us, I always got all kinds of things going on in my head. And right now it's sort of George Floyd, COVID, the election, all that stuff is embedded in there. But I'm influenced by all kinds of people, and this isn't everybody I've influenced by, of all walks of life, at different times of life, of places, of experiences, um, as well as people that I wish weren't in my head, but that's there too. Um, and I just kind of wanted to put that there as, as a way to be transparent. And that's my Afro from seventh grade. Let's not dwell too much on that. A couple of more things I want to throw on the table um, and pulling them from the book from Black Faces. One is the, qu the question of representation, which has been up for a long time, but I think in the past four or five months, it's all over the place. Visual representation, what stories are we going to tell? Who do we see and how we see them? I like to show this uh, image of a LeBron James and supermodel Giselle Bündchen from 2010. First time a black man was put on the cover of Vogue. And when this came out and you know, LeBron James, awesome, awesome, awesome. I don't have anything critical to say about LeBron James. 
Um, but what I will say is that when this came out, a lot of Black people got upset. And so on social media, they were saying it. They got upset because they said, well, you know, you put LeBron on, fantastic, but why does the man look so primal? Wah! Why couldn't he have been more dignified or elegant or something? Then somebody turned up this poster, which is from 1917. So 1917, look at it together. Look at the colors of her dress. And the editor said, actually, they didn't know about the poster. That was the, you know, that was the, that was what they were putting out there for the public. I don't think anybody is buying that, but I'm just saying. And the question for me, it reveals for me a lot of what, you know, how we have constructed our um, stories about Black people, and I mean, I know I understand it's Black, the diverseness of Blackness in this country, but Black people in nature, this idea of Black pe people being connected to the primitive. When we had our world's fairs in this country back in the late 1800s and early 1900s, as what must have been exciting times for some, because it was about how can we be innovative? How are we going to move forward as a people, as a culture, as a nation. And so we're having these kind of conversations and seeing what people are coming up with in terms of their ideas. And we're also putting black and brown people on display at these places as the thing we might wanna move away from. I like to tell the story, well, I don't like to tell the story, but I often tell the story of Oda Banga, a black man from the Congo, a young black man who was discovered and brought back here and put on display at the American Museum of Natural History. Now that's my favorite museum, the first museum I ever went to. He was put on display there as representative of the missing link. And then because the museum people thought, well, not enough people are gonna see this young man, you know, the missing link. So they moved him to the primate exhibit at the Bronx Zoo until enough people protested to have him removed. And there are plenty of stories like this. I wish those were the only two, but there were plenty of them over time. When we jump ahead to um, President Obama being the, self, the first self-identified African-American president, and we start looking at the way social media and people in a position to have their views heard talk about him and his family, Glenn Beck talking about Obama's Planet of the Apes. Um, the mayor, the woman from West Virginia who was calling Michelle Obama an ape in heels. Uh, Sean Delonis, a cartoonist for the New York Post who when the stimulus bill came out, had a large cartoon of a dead, chimp chim dead chimpanzee with a, a sign that says stimulus bill pinned to his chest with two white cops standing over him with smoking guns. There were over and over, the watermelon patch in front of the White House, over and over and over again. I think there's a clear link between the world's fairs, between slavery, Jim Crow, um, the eugenics movement, um, uh, LeBron James in this moment on the cover of Vogue, representation, it's there all the time. When people say black people are just too sensitive, let me tell you something. When you've spent 400 years having your ancestors and yourself dehumanized, you would be sensitive too. And it's amazing, right, that as human beings, that collectively, that we're still incredibly resilient and focused often on Black joy and human joy, just human joy, and still manage to do that in spite of the abuse that comes our way all the time. Two last things I want to say, because I don't want to take up a ton of time. One of the things that came up for me was also the power of memory, talking to a lot of African-Americans, particularly older African-Americans, about what they trust in terms of knowledge and what they can rely upon. Because when your history and experience gets erased, when your history and experience doesn't count, you become the ones in, that are are the memory keepers. You become the ones that have to tell the stories. They have to mean something in terms of developing your own truth because the larger truth, the larger dominant truth doesn't actually see you. And in the best case scenario, doesn't know how to see you. And in the worst case scenario, doesn't care to see you, right? So you're always ducking and weaving around that and telling your stories. One of the stories that I tell is about my, my parents I was living in Atlanta in 2005 and writing this up as a dissertation and got my parents to come visit me there. And my parents aren't travelers, but they came down and my father's always held something against the national parks because of that first time when he wasn't able to get a job because he was black. But I was gonna tell him, we're gonna have the black national park experience. We're gonna go to Dr. Martin Luther King National Historic Site. And he was real reluctant about it. My mother was down, but you know, but we did it. If you've ever been there, it's on a street where people live, Ebenezer Baptist Church, the house Dr. King grew up in, and a visitor center. We walk into the visitor center, my mom wanders off, and at the time, it was all dioramas. 
images from the 50s and 60s. Dr. King's voice coming over a loudspeaker, sounds of people rioting coming over their loudspeaker, large um, life-size images of people, um, you know, marching, a replica of the cell, the cell that Dr. King lived in. The idea was that you were going to be inundated, you were having a full sensory experience. Well, my father, who was hardcore, like really serious, stoic, don't show no kind of vulnerability, scares me, you know, used to really scare me. Um, I'm standing with him in front of one of these exhibits and we're not a touchy feely family, you know, because my parents, you know, they were too old. We were already gone from the house by the time Oprah and Cosby came out and we, we won't even re reference Cosby anymore, but you know what I'm talking about. Different ways you can raise black kids, but look. So suddenly my dad grabs my arm and he grabs it hard, right? So this is 2005 and I'm like grown and everything. I kind of freak. I look over at him, he blanched. I thought he's having a heart attack. And the next second after that, the man giggles. And I think to myself, that is even weirder than anything right now because my father is not a giggler. And then what he does is he points to an image. And the image was a replica of a sign that said, for whites only. When he points to the sign, he said, I saw that sign. And for a minute, I thought we weren't supposed to be here. All that fortress that he had built up to protect himself all that years, all the sensory inload, he forgot. And he actually thought that we have to get out. And he was grabbing me to protect me and say, we've got to go. And I told this story over a hundred times and I am moved every single time because that's the first time I actually got to see and understand what that man had been carrying around his entire life. It didn't justify a lot of the anger and the limitations that I felt he placed on me as a young person, but it explained it. And it really helped me to really hold that differently in terms of how we move forward and all the people that hold it within their memory, that hold it within their DNA, that hold it within their dreams, that hold it within their spirit, the kind of excessive healing that is needed. And it's not a healing to be done on one's own because it is in relationship with others that have to recognize it, reconcile it, be accountable. We can all be accountable in different ways about that. Okay, I won't say much more about this, but somebody can ask me about this, yes. But I, you know, I have so many things to say about this. Uh, you know, Christian Cooper having his skin weaponized him in Central, in Central Park. Um, I think a lot about John Muir because I am working on a one woman show myself in conversation with John Muir called the N word nature revisited. And you can ask me cause it's, it is happening. It is, there's a lot happening here. And I was in part motivated a few years ago because somebody put me on a panel and we all had to answer the question of whether or not John Muir was still relevant. This was in 2016 when it was the hundredth year anniversary of the national parks. It was a geography conference. There were like seven to eight of us on the panel from different disciplines. And I decided to give like a, we had 10 minutes and I said, I'm going to do like a little performance thing with this. And part of what I did was take one of John Muir's works, a thousand mile walk through the Gulf, in 1867. And I said, what if a black woman had written this? So, you know, he spent a year walking across Southern states and Cuba trying to understand the impact of war on the landscape. And I lifted some of his quotes, the beautiful things he said about non-human nature, as well as the racist things that he said about black people. It's his own language, in his own words. And I shared that with the audience, like, first he's noticing the incredible sunset. Next, he's talking about the lazy black people. It's amazing. You know, he's complicated, right? Um, and I decided, I was inspired by Alice Randall, who's a black writer in the early 2000s, who was at Harvard, who thought, what if Gone with the Wind, that story about the white Southern experience on the backdrop, on the backs of slaves, enslaved people, was told from the perspective of a black woman. And she called, she wrote it, it's great. It's called The Wind Done Gone. <laughs> and I, so I decided a thousand mile walk through the Gulf in 1867 is going to be written by a black woman. We're going to rename it and call it a thousand mile walk was rough. And the person writing this Sojourner Washington Douglas. And what I did was I created some quotes about how she, when she was born in, into slavery and didn't know her name, how in order to get North, she was too dark to pass. So she had to take the back roads. But I looked at some real facts of lynchings that were going on in that time too in the South. And I kept going with her and I'd get to 1890 and say, Jim Crow was the man. 1900, Jim Crow was the man. 1910, Jim Crow was the man. And I kept going until 1940 when she passed away and Jim Crow was still the man. And then I wanted to imagine what if John Muir and I were in conversation and I wrote a scene which I won't read here and I made it kind of funny, but 
uh, imagine, he wouldn't imagine me sitting on the National Parks Advisory Board. I was the only African-American on the board at the time. And he imagined me cleaning his house, but I made it funny and that I was trying to meet him. The point that I wanna make here is that actually, it's not that he becomes irrelevant. I, I think that's actually disingenuous because number one, it, it makes him two dimensional. Number two, it denies whether we like it or not, the impact he, he has had on the way we think about conservation and the environment in the United States. And number three, he becomes relevant on my terms, right? It is not, not my story or his, it is actually how those stories stand in relationship and intention with each other, because that tells a fuller truth of who we are in this country. And that is what I am interested in. I am not interested in becoming the, uh, the one who erases, the one who oppresses, and the one who forgets. I've been on the other side of that. I'm interested in just being able to be whole and to invite others to do it too, but not to dominate the space in the way that they have been dominated. The space has been dominated for the last 400 years. So this is my last slide. And I often hear, and I will stop and I talk about risk and always saying to people that it's not about, for me, it's not about taking a risk in order to, because you're afraid of losing something. It's taking a risk because you're, you, you are willing to risk in order to gain something. And that it is also not about being comfortable. For many of us, we've never been comfortable, right? The, 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 the stories of Christian Cooper and George Floyd for me exist on a continuum, not a hierarchy. And the continuum is you can in this country drive while black, hike while black, walk while black, sleep while black and be killed. That's one under the continuum. And in the other, where many of us occupy all the time is this insecure place that you can just get challenged, that you are ducking and weaving across a hostile landscape, just like Sojourner Washington Douglas all the time. Which doesn't mean that you are continually leaving your life in fear because you know what? We are also whole multidimensional beings that are fun and joyous like the people in Lovecraft country that see the monsters and that are going on, but they're loving and dancing and singing and afraid and angry and crying because we are humans. The last thing that I wanna say, I know I said that, but the last thing I wanna say, cause I wanna honor her is a story that came up this summer for me about a young 15 year old black girl in Wellington, Florida. And her name is um, Brianna Nelson Hicks. And Brianna Nelson Hicks, 15, Wellington, Florida is a very wealthy, predominantly white neighborhood. And her and her grandfather happened to live there. And she was standing with two white friends in front of their house talking. And the video is of an older white man yelling at her, telling her that she doesn't belong there, right? Is anybody flashing back, right, to my own experience when I was nine, to the sense of all the times, to the experience of George Floyd, to Christian Cooper, to the many other black and brown people, um, trans people, all kinds of people who get challenged simply by showing up as who they are in the fullness of their own sovereignty and their, whole, and their agency as who they are. Dr. Damaris Hill, who's an amazing African-American poet, she's based at the University of Kentucky, uh, talks about this in her book, A Bound Woman is a Dangerous Thing. And I just wanna leave with a quote of hers. She says, at the end of the day, she says, do no harm, take no shit. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Finney. That was, wow. Um, I'm not often, at a loss for words, but that, that was kind of remarkable, so very powerful. And I can see from some of the comments that we've seen in the chat so far, that that's how the audience is feeling. So I just want us to take a couple of seconds so we can take a breath and, and really reflect on some of that. And um, Sue and I are going to be asking some of our own questions and also some questions that we get from the, the audience so that we can engage and immerse ourselves more fully in, in this experience that we're sharing with you. Fantastic, I'm trying to, I'm sorry, I, because what happened was all of your pictures, everything shrunk and it's like, I wanna get it like, so it's on my full screen and I don't know what happened, but um, I'll stop share, that's what happened. Now I got you. Okay, right. there we go. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> yes, perfect, perfect, yes. Yes, thank you so much, um, Dr. Finney. That was incredible. And you've literally hit on um, almost every dimension of how race, identity, and history are both shaping of the environment, but also shaping of our futures and our past on the land. 
Um, so I, I feel like we have so much to hit. Um, Michelle, would you like to start with a question of your own or, or should we dive into the chat first? Well, I, I certainly do have several questions of my own and I want to start with one of those. And sure. it's um, about the, the parallels between the conservation movement and the protection of land and the, the protection of resources. Yeah. While at the same time, there were laws and policies, whether they were formal or informal, being used to subjugate um, not just African-Americans, but, but basically non-whites. Yeah. And those things were happening at the same time. And, and we're talking about late 1800s, early 1900s and yeah. on. And then I, I just want to, to think about our current context and how you see those parallels happening today. And if you could give us some insight on that. I can try, yes, yes, yes. Um, so I'm thinking about, I've been thinking a lot about the fugitive slave laws. Like, so, mm -hmm. you, know, um, you know, understanding, and I really, one of the really great gifts and privileges of serving on the National Parks Advisory Board is that for eight years, we would have meetings of a couple of times a year. We would always go to a national park. And I really haven't been, I've been to a few national parks before that, but, you know, I was usually more comfortable going out of the country when I could to, to do some hiking or trekking than I was within this country. And I learned a lot because the park rangers are amazing. The interpreters are amazing storytellers. And I think I was in Boston on the African-American Heritage Trail and the, the um, ranger taking us around talked about the future of slave laws, which I realized. And then I had to come back and read about this idea that, you know, people could come up, you know, so if enslaved people ran away, ran south, you know, abolitionists helped, they got to the places like Boston. But it became a point, as I understand it, that you didn't have to be an actual sheriff, you know, or formal police officer. You, all you have to do really is be white. And mm -hmm. you could stop any black person and be like, you're arrested, like <laughs> that, that's it, right? You know, if we think about today, the legacy of um, as a black or brown person, you know, friends of mine who don't identify as African-American, but maybe Latinx, or maybe it doesn't matter, Muslim, it actually doesn't matter how they identify, it's really how they are seen, that mm -hmm. you can simply be stopped, you can be asked for papers, you can be shot, you can be arrested, you can be insulted, you can be challenged, you know. For me, that's a direct line of, you know, that's in our DNA as a country. It's in our DNA as a country. We've always, we've made that okay. We've legitimized it culturally, right? Even if we haven't legislated it so explicitly, right? For a time there, we did. And I don't know that we've ever fully addressed that. So I feel that is one of the issues that shows up really easily and obviously. Yeah, thank you so much. Did you wanna jump into the chat or can, should I go for a question of go mine? Go ahead, Sue, yeah. Okay, um, well, one of the things, I have, oh my gosh, I, the list is too long and we don't have time. But um, <laughs> one of the things that I think is really exciting is this idea, the word fugitive was used when you were talking about fugitive slave laws. And um, I, I think a lot about how fugitivity is this dual-sided thing um, where it's, it's both um, a means of control uh, or a response to control um, and escape, but it's also this sort of other space where um, people who have been made fugitives, right, by, by those who are oppressing might actually come to know nature and land in a way that is unique yes. and separate from yes. those who are in control. So can yep. you talk a little bit about how fugitivity shapes um, alternative and black and brown visions of nature and experiences of nature? Look at you, Dr. Suzanne. Nobody's asked me that before. So um, so what comes up for me, and it's always a story comes up for me. I'm thinking about, um, it's probably been 10 years or so ago. I worked with a team on the Great Dis a project on the Great Dismal Swamp. It was, um, ah, the Great Dismal Swamp. Okay, excellent. So the Great Dismal Swamp, the project was um, Dan Sayers, who's a white archaeologist, as I know, I met him as a grad student, and he, you know, the work, so the Great Dismal Swamp, for everybody who doesn't know, is a, a wide expanse of swamp, basically swampland. It's uh, Virginia, uh, Virginia doesn't run all the way down to the Carolinas, right? Um, and uh, they got a team of us in there because Dan Sayers, as a graduate student, found the remains of enslaved Africans who had been living in the swamp. Now, I don't mean just hanging out there after they ran away from the plantation for a few days living, in some cases for years. And Fish and Wildlife is the government agency in control of that. So part of 
the job is trying to, how to get fish and wildlife to think about and expand the narrative of the human presence, because often the job of that agency is to look at fish and wildlife, you know, mainly. Uh, and, and, and Black people weren't the only ones who were in this space. But one of the things that, one of the, 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 the work for myself was to interview Black people who's in Suffolk County who live nearby about their own ideas and stories of the swamp and what did they think about the swamp. Um, and when I think about myself, that there were stories of even this one couple, black couple got married in the swamp. No, I mean back, you know, who had escaped, they built a life in there. If you've ever been in that swamp, like now there's trails you can kind of walk part way in, but you can't get through that swamp. But you're, you're gonna, you'd have to go in the water. There's all kinds of things, wildlife, bears, it's, you know, it's a little, for me, it was a little scary, beautiful and scary. So when I think of the, the fugi fugitivity, I don't know that, I wonder if the black people who had escaped and lived in there would have called themselves fugitives. You know, you know it's interesting whoever gets to do the naming and the claiming. Mm -hmm. you know, were they about freedom? You know, that maybe, is that what a freedom fighter or what were they, were, were they about? How would they define who they are? You know, I was talking to a group yesterday and I said, you know, in my birth certificate, which is, I was adopted, so you never get to see your original birth certificate, but on the one that's given, my legal one, I was born in 1959. And what it says is Negro baby. <laughs> now, I, I'm pretty sure that my black parents who raised me and my other parents, like that wasn't their choice, <laughs> right? The idea that that naming you know, for many of us comes from the outside, that representation of you, that the box you are in, the skin you are in, you know. So I think of fugitive, because the fugitive slave law, what is, on that one thing, when we hear fugitive, a fugitive of the law, you're a fugitive of the law from the law, you know, you're doing something wrong, um, there's an implication we need to stop you, there's an implication that we need to be afraid of you. When in the case of them, there's like, they were human beings who wanted their freedom and they were willing to risk living in a swamp that can kill you in a minute over staying on a plantation, which really throws that narrative out of the water that, you know, well, some slaves had it good on the plantation, you know? Uh, well, you know, it, it, it depends on who you're asking, right? Okay. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, we've looked at connections between people of African descent and the natural environment in a number of different ways. And a lot of the times when we, we see in the popular press about African Americans don't do in the natural environment, they're talking about they don't go to national parks, they don't, they, they don't go to national forests, they don't engage in the natural environment in traditional Eurocentric ways. We know that's not true. There is some of that engagement, but we also know there's a different kind of relationship between people of African descent and the natural environment. And you just spoke about some of that with people escaping to swamps and so on. So what other kinds of ways do we see people of African environment engaging with the natural environment outside of these specific spaces that the media seems to direct us to? Yes. So I want to back up a little bit. That's a great question and say that part of the challenge is that I think that those in a position of privilege have shaped the conversation about our relationship as human beings to non-human, to the environment in a very particular way. Two frames, two paradigms we tend to use. One is that the environment is a supermarket of resources for our use. And the other is that we engage with it through recreation and leisure. Uh, as though those are the only two ways. Not even, I don't, I'm not, and I'm not even gonna to touch the indigenous perspective that you know, is completely different. The, and the bigger idea that we are somehow separate from nature, which is why I work really hard to say things like non-human nature, because I'm trying so hard to change the way I've been educated to consider that I'm not of nature, that I'm somehow separate and watching it. Because the minute we separate ourselves, man, it makes it so much easier to take advantage of it mm -hmm, mm -hmm. without feeling anything about it. Cause that's what we do with each other all the time, right? Um, God, I lost my way there. So all the other ways that other ways that we show up. So uh, I was living in Florida for a year and um, also around 2004 or something like that when I was doing this research. And I was living in Miami and in part, I wanted to live, I, wasn't, I was an hour away from Everglades National Park, um, Biscayne National Park 
And then in the other direction, kind of west, I believe it was Big Cypress National Preserve. And I spent a lot of time talking to staff, you know, at the time of predominantly white staff, really good folks working at the park. And they were really interested in getting more African-American and Latinx folks and families out to the park. But they had a hard time doing that in part because it's an hour away. Not everybody has a car, can afford a car. And there was no public transportation at the time. But it was interesting. I remember an early conversation. One of them said, well, you know, Black people don't, you know, but what you just said, they're not interested or they don't come out here. Uh, and I said, you know, what's really interesting about the Everglades is that the Everglades as a park is bounded. The Everglades as a place is not. And mm -hmm. all through South Florida, there's canals. I would, in Miami, you know, I'd be going up to Fort Lauderdale. I'm driving around, Homestead. There are canals. And almost every day you see black and brown people out there fishing on the canals. They're out there every day. They may be fishing to put food on the table, fishing because it's a social occasion, fishing for meditation. They're just out there every day. When I said that as an example, I remember the response was, oh, yeah, but that doesn't count. And I was like, ah, and when I say, ah, there's the, you know, that's where it's at. That's, that's the issue right there. Not that black and brown people don't and fill in the blanks. You know what? Black and brown people do the same things as everybody else. You have some black people who don't like to do things. You have some white people who don't like to do things and some brown people who don't like to do things because we're like that as human beings, right? We're just incredibly complex and diverse. But it's just so interesting that because you've had it's not an industry necessarily, but a sector, you know, the environmental sector that has been largely, the people who've largely run it and been the leaders have largely been white. You know, remember back to that issue of subjectivity and perspective. You know, you don't know what you don't know. It doesn't make you a bad person, but it becomes lopsided in terms of power, in terms of to understand you don't know what you don't know and you don't have to actually challenge or look at your own perspective as being somewhat problematic because it privileges a point of view and makes it universal for everybody else, which means, so not only do you not know what you don't know, but you don't have to know what you don't know. And the rest of us, we got to know everything because we got to know how to duck and weave so that when we're on that continuum with Christian Cooper and George Floyd, we don't want to die. And I'm being a little dramatic, but not really, <laughs> you know, because, you know, there's enough examples about how that can be true, right? And for those of us who are really interested in not only living in our anger, because that serves no one in terms of health and, and joy, but actually channeling that in a creative way, because we're interested in building those relationships differently. We're interested in remembering and thinking future, you know? What is that going to look like? And how are we and ours and all the ancestors and people yet to come going to be able to show up in conjunction, in relationship, in healthy, good relationship with everybody? I don't want to deny anybody their sovereignty. And what is that old saying? What if I can't be free until you are free? And so that relies on a kind of collective work. But I want to be clear here. For me, not everybody has the same work to do. Right? And that you know, <laughs> that's the hard place to stand. I, I, one of the things that I say when I'm working with predominantly white groups, particularly the last four months, because I don't know about you too, but my work is blown out of the water. Like I have no, like it just, after the George Floyd Black Lives Matter, like everything exploded, right? And I say, you know, I said, I can't imagine what it feels like to be white right now, to be, to be white and be concerned and interested and engaged and trying to figure it out. Because there's something different at play if you identify as white. There, there's something different at play in terms of what you have to recognize and own, or you're being asked to recognize and own. And it's got to be incredibly destabilizing, right? Because it, for me, that's why I, it's, not worth, it's not worth the conversation to say some people are bad or some people are good, because it, it doesn't get us down the road to understand the complicatedness of who we all are. And a lot of us, I think, in, our, in terms of our basic humanity, are good people. You know, in, you know we're, we're trying to show up with like, we want to love and be fun and have fun and feed our families and our friends and learn and get creative and con con contribute. Not everybody, but I think for the most part, you know, I feel I've been out there a lot. I think, you know, I've met a lot of amazing people all around this country, all around this country you know, small places, large places that invite me in. And I'm like, look at these people. They're really trying to figure it out. 
So I have some sense of empathy for that, for what that is. And at the same time, and I say this with great feeling, that you have to be willing to take that on because that's your work to do. And I'm cheering from you from the rafters because I understand that my life will be better protected and our life that we want will be better realized if you are also doing the work you need to do. Right, right. Thank you so much for, for that. I just wanted to jump in because there's a really, a couple of relevant questions to that point and I'm feeling it too, but- Sorry, I get the, No, 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 I yeah. like actually definitely cried during your talk. So let's not even get into it. But um, <laughs> the word accountability came up in your, um, um, in your talk, but also in these questions, and a couple of people are asking, how, how do we take what you're talking about, that sense of we have the right intentions, and many of us have sort of this, the emotional grounding for the work, but not necessarily the orientation or um, the directions to, to act on that. And so how do we define, describe, and hold accountability for Ooh. Not only for ourselves, yeah. I think as people of color, thinking about like how do we we you know remain accountable to um, the project of freedom and liberation to our for ourselves, but then also people who are not people of color, yeah. um, how how does accountability? Operate? Yeah, that is a, what an excellent question. Um, so a couple of things for me is, you know, I often say to people, and and I, I apologize for those who've heard me say this before. There's an internal assessment. So whether or not you're an individual and or you're talking about an organization or a business or an institution, I think there, um, the geography me thinks in scale. And I think there's both individual, organizational and institutional assessment. And what I mean by that is, how do you get real with yourself about where you are in terms of questions of equity and accountability? And this is hard. You know what? I, like everybody else, am incredibly imperfect, right? And you know, you know, <laughs> so, I am I'm older, you know, I used to be thin and I had it all going on and I don't know what happened the last 10, 15 years. Like I gained weight and things went down. Then I moved to Vermont and it was winter, I was eating more. Then it was COVID that I was eating more. And I kept looking in the mirror trying to deny the fact your clothes don't fit in quite the same way they did <laughs> like a year ago. And then I had to get real. And then I did this, I did this diet for three months. This metal I said, oh, this shit has gotten real. I got to, you know, cause no one's gonna tell me because everybody around me is really nice. <laughs> and so I had to tell myself and then I could tell others and ask for support. I say, okay, here's what I'm doing. So I need to tell you, so I need your help to get me to do this thing for my own health and well being. Internal assessment is how do you call yourself out so that others can then call you in? What is your capacity as an individual and or organization or an institution to do the thing that you aspire, you aspire to? How do you separate in terms of accountability the intention or the set of intentions you set for yourself and your aspirations? Your aspirations are not the same as your intentions. Your intentions may get you to your aspirations. Oftentimes I find that people want to jump to aspiration because, you know, it's less painful if we can just go there and be like, we're there. We don't have to deal with where we are right now. And I always say, wherever you go, there you are. So you know, how do you start from where you are? And I would offer that in terms of everybody needs to identify accountability on their own terms. You can do it in relationship with others. Part of it is one of the things when I work with students, I have them write an environmental autobiography. And I say, you can't get this assignment wrong in any way. What I want you to tell me in three to five pages is your own influence of nature, the environment, your family, whatever place it is, however that looks for you, for you to think about it intentionally, because then you start to understand your own positionality. Only when you own it and it has value, whatever the story is, has value because it has informed you, right? But you have to own it and you have to own the dark corners, right? To understand how you can be accountable, I've been thinking a lot. Last night, I was, I, one of the talks I did online was with um, Woman Stand Shining, who's a, Pat McCabe, who's a Dene woman. And we had a conversation about Red Nation, Black Nation. We said, let's have this conversation. And it got real. And there were 150 people watching as we just got deep and real about the challenges. And one of the things that's challenging for me, I honor the, the Native and Indigenous presence, but I, I'm awkward around it. 
like, ah, how do we talk about reparations? It's not the same as decolonization because really, how can we have black people ask for the land when the land was never any of ours in the first place, <laughs> right? What about the people who were here before? How do we hold the fact that native people had slaves? How do we hold the fact you know, that racism exists in the black community and the native community. <laughs> like there, there are really hard questions that we all want to be better at. And so who, what am I accountable to? And only I and those that I trust to tell me in the most loving and clear way, you know, can help me get there. And my accountability then can help me shape my intention. This is not about guilt, folks. Someone told me a long time ago that guilty makes you feel like you're doing something, <laughs> but you're just not, you're not doing anything. And I hate feeling guilty, but I, you know, I have it all the time, right? I have to go, oh, you act like you're doing something because you feel guilty. <laughs> if you feel guilty, how do you intend to the intention of your good, in, your good intentions, the impact of your good intentions? What does that look like? And understanding it as a process, not a goal. Understanding and never forgetting your humanity. Recognizing that self-care, this is a really challenging process for everybody. This is not about a hierarchy of my pain is more than yours. Hierarchy, as we many of us know, does not get us anywhere. Because if we want to shift that power dynamic, we think relationally. What do you have agency of, over? What, how can you choose differently? What do you need in order to make that choice? What does courage look like for you? Not what it looks like because the movie told you that. What does it look like in your own life? Not the size of the action, but the intention behind the action. My favorite quote this past week is um, from Congressman James Clyburn, who's an African-American congressman in South Carolina. And he's been on the news a lot lately. And I have to, I always have to make sure I get it right, because I, I want, oh my God. He said, if the distance between my opponent and me is five steps, I don't mind taking three of them. And he said it calmly, like, you know, the strength of character, the clear intention, the vision that's there, the understanding of oneself so well that I lose nothing about myself by taking that third step. The sense of the freedom is, in here. And I understand that I have the freedom to make a different choice. That for me is in part will serve how you determine one is accountable. First, how are you accountable to yourself and how you show up in this conversation and in the work? I can't think of a, a more perfect way in which to end this conversation. I am so sorry that this conversation has to end. But we are unfortunately at 315, and I don't know where the time went because I have two hours of conversation at least left to have with you. But I, I, we unfortunately do need to end here. But I wonder if you could just give some closing thoughts. We have a number of college students who are in uh -huh. our audience today. And I know you talk about not being able to get to Kumbaya without doing the work. <laughs> and uh, we're going through this, this period of reckoning in all kinds of things. Yeah. Healthcare, laws, job opportunities, um, and so on. But we're also going through this reckoning in terms of, of how we connect to land and, and the natural environment. And so I'm wondering if you could share some closing thoughts with our students about the kind of work that they could be engaging in to move yeah. this movement forward. So I, you know, one of the, I, yeah, yes. Yeah. So I've been talking to different groups of students around the country on Zoom, of course, you know, in the past five months, and we often have these conversations. And one of the things that I say is, you know, you know, yes, I, because I come from, some would say, this eclectic background, I dropped out of college because not because I didn't like school, but because I knew I wanted to act and it's not what my family wanted me to do. And I said, that's just the choice I had to make. And that's why it was 15 years and I decided I wanted to go back because I thought it would serve the larger intention of what I wanted. I have gone through the academy and have been privileged in order to do so and gone deeply in debt in order to do it, but I had no intention. My primary goal was not to become a tenured professor, but I thought maybe I gotta pay bills and maybe there's a way to situate myself an institution to do this public work in the way that I wanna do it. I found out the hard way at UC Berkeley 
um, and to a lesser degree, University of Kentucky, even though they recruited me, that actually the way that I show up in the work is not how they wanted me to be there. And it nearly did me in. And I had enough people out there supporting me and I kept getting all this out from outside of the people wanted me. And so one of the things that I learned is, this is why when I say know thyself, and I, and I say this knowing I don't come from wealth, I will probably be deeply in debt for the rest of my life. I don't even own a car. I use car shares, I rent apartments, you know. I do have some nice clothes, as I like to say, because, you know, girl ain't perfect. But, <laughs> you know, I have lots of debt, you know, I kind of just try to make it work. But I've also come to a place where I've created this life that I'm doing the work that I want to do and how I can show up. It was about to serve in service to the work. If I'm not free to show up as I need to show up, the work isn't served. And the job that I do isn't in the one ads. There's something about this moment. I have never had my email. I mean, I was flying almost every week before. It is blown up beyond proportion that people, there, there are organizations and businesses now even that want to have these conversations and don't know how to do it and are engaging it or asking to write about it and think about it and talk about it and do it. And there's a lot of emotional labor involved. So again, the self-care piece, piece is really important. But I would ask you to think about what is the work you want to do? Not what is the work is there, you know, out there, how can you get hired? Because that is a very limited perspective. Remember, remember that around this subject, that you've got a majority population, many of them smart, many of them thoughtful and engaged, but as many of the questions have shown, don't know actually what to do around this issue, right? So waiting to get hired, <laughs> by people who could be well-meaning but actually don't know what to do isn't necessarily your best shot. Your experience, not only your academic experience, your lived experience, the time you've spent being rigorous about your dreams, about your vision and your intention, your ability to articulate that, to communicate that in a way that serves the vision and allows you to fully show up. That is what you have to offer. You are all incredibly unique because you were born at a very particular time. Everything that's hard about this year, there is so much that's hard about this year. There have always been this moment in US history where it's incredibly hard for a lot of people. And what's really incredible is how we come out of those moments. And you were born, you were born, and I mean as an adult, right now. So this is about that courage. And I mean it not in some movie way, but in the way of what is the risk you're willing to take? Because it is worth it. It is worth it. And you will be met by that. Yeah, sometimes, you know, an older Black friend of mine says to me, you know, when all that stuff is going down in Berkeley, she said, you know, when you're at the front of the line, and when you're on the edge, on the cutting edge, and you're pushing, you are going to get arrows in your ass. And here's what I got to say to that. Just wear better padding and keep right on going. So, yeah. And I can't wait to see what you're going to do. Thank you. Thank you so much for blessing us with this, this your insight, your knowledge, your experiences. I, I am sure we are all better people for having engaged in this experience this afternoon. I am so happy. You know, this is, this is the work. And, you know, I was telling somebody lately, some old boyfriend wrote me recently and he was like, happy birthday, because I just had my birthday. And he said, um, I, I need to know what's going on, but don't tell me about your professional life. Tell me about your personal life. And I haven't written him back because I got to write a long email to him. But the main thing I have to say is, that's what you never understood about me. Mm. The work is personal. Wow. <laughs> Literally a word, a word. Right? If anyone, no one has ever articulated that more clearly than you just now. Bam. <laughs> Bam. Mic drop. Yeah, honestly, <laughs> done. It's a wrap. Everyone go home. Take it easy. You're already out. <laughs> that's, that's a wow. sound bite. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. yes so much, Carolyn. That's, that's, that's it. That is it. <laughs> that is it. Oh my God. I don't want to go. I don't want to go. <laughs> well, we can okay, certainly so. stay after for coffee, but you know, <laughs> let's, let's just wrap it up officially yes, yes. before Freddie checks up on us again. 
you know, but I, I'm in Vermont. Somebody phenomenal. just asked if I was in Kentucky. I live in Burlington, Vermont now because I'm doing a part-time residency with Middlebury College. And the um, rest of the time I'm doing this. Amazing. Somebody's Thanks. asking for a part two. Perhaps in spring we will do a part two. Maybe, but I want to yeah. take a second and just thank um, Professor Stevie Ruiz, who yeah. really was um, critical to putting this all together, inviting me, Michelle, um, and Carolyn to speak to one another. Um, and Stevie is a professor of uh, Chicano Chicana Studies at um, CSUN, uh, Cal Stevie, State Northridge. Stevie, show yourself. So, yes, please sh reveal yourself, Stevie. There's like eight Hi. Stevies in the audience. We had some technical <laughs> difficulties. There are there are clones. I don't want to get into it. <laughs> It won't let you show your video. No, oh my gosh. Well, everyone should know Stevie's amazing. Um, yes. Freddie Sanchez as well at CSUN. Yes. Dr. Uh, Sanchez, thank you so much for putting this together as well. So um, CSUN, the, the GOAT. <laughs> yes. And, and, and if you're in the audience and, and you're thinking about where you can come and have an awesome university experience, <laughs> I highly recommend CSUN. I highly recommend the Department of Recreation and Tourism Management. We do all kinds of phenomenal things and Chicano studies as well. And we work very well together as, along with our Africana studies department. Um, I am, um, I hope Stevie is somebody saving the chat because you know, I don't look at the chat when I'm in conversation, but I'd love to read because I know a lot of people left comments and questions. And, I, and um, so I apologize to people that I wasn't responding. It's just, that I can't, you know, I'm trying to, yeah, we focused. Yeah, we tried to keep up. There were so many good questions. There's, I think yeah, Stevie's got to download and and we'll get those questions um, to you in the in your email um, in your already fraught email. <laughs> and um, and then I and I also wanted to just shout out if if folks didn't get it, I think you probably did. But um, Dr. Finney's um, book uh, is Black Faces, White Spaces. Um, so if you want to, that's a 2014 book, and you can look that up. Um, and then also carolynfinney.com. I don't know if you'd like to boost yourself, but I'll do it because I'm shameless. So anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Go, Dr. Suzanne. <laughs> <laughs> Google Dr. Finney, everyone. Um, all the students yes. on here. Well, I mean, I'm, as people are getting off, the thing that, you know, I wanted to say, and I just forgot, but I will say this, at least to all of you who are still on, is that, so, you know, the, the, the personal thing that pushes me again is to have my parents' story told. And one of the things that's happened during COVID is, um, well, last year, the New York Botanical Gardens had reached out to me about doing a short residency, a melon residency for two or three weeks. And it was supposed to have been this summer, but like a lot of people, you can't do anything in person. So it got pushed off till next summer and they had me do a webinar back in September. And I've been talking with them a lot. And I told them a story about how for my parents' 40th wedding anniversary, my father had given my mother a weeping cherry blossom tree that is on the estate. But when my parents left, they couldn't take the tree with them, obviously, right? It's embedded in there. And the New York Botanical Garden said, you know, we can get permission from the land trust and get a sampling of that tree and bring it to the New York Botanical Gardens so that we can, the story can be told there. But this, the pot gets even thicker, right? So. I got really excited by that. And they said, we'd love for you to do a first round of your the N-word, Nature Revisited, next summer. So I'm working on that this winter. So I'm all excited. Meanwhile, because I had spoken at the Telluride Film Festival a year ago about this. Did I say this already? I said oh. it somebody, I, you know, lately I said it some to somebody else today. And there were a lot of filmmakers and stuff there. And, you know, that was over a year ago. A month ago, um, a filmmaker, um, Irene Taylor, who's a white woman, she's won Emmys, Oscar nominated, reached out to me. And she said, I'd love to talk with you on Zoom. And she told me that, you know, she had been in the audience when I told that story about my parents and everything, and that she was doing a documentary for HBO on trees. And what she wanted to do, she was taking a couple of different trees, but also telling the human story around a particular tree. And she gave me some examples of what she was already doing and it's going to be this wide array but she realized and remembered me I remember that she's not there was no African-American story in there but she also didn't think you know she was the one or comfortable to tell a story about lynching and trees which people often go to right about black people so when I'm talking with her on zoom I you know I said well it doesn't always have to be you know about black people and lynching and trees like you know there could be something else so I told her the story about the cherry blossom tree to give her an example the short of it is, she loved the story so much, she said, can you please any, what archival material do you have about you and your family? So I had, you know, eight, eight millimeter film from the 70s of us as kids on the estate, old pictures. I had my parents in Virginia, my brothers pulling stuff up. 
that's going to be one of the stories in the HBO documentary is about the cherry tree. She's going to come out with me when we get permission to go on the property and get the sampling and be interviewed. And then to top it off, she wants to film a piece of the one woman show that will bookend the segment that will be in the documentary about my parents' story and our family's time on that land. Oh, that is amazing. And that, amazing. that is amazing. I just, and the, I have to now write the thing, you know, I have four things to say. <laughs> Hello, but I, if, because of the pandemic and the way my life is and I live alone, I'm going to, from mid-December to end of January, I had this big chunk of time. Mm -hmm. I, I have had no time in the last five months, but I will to, to really focus and, and write it. So I feel really grateful for that. Um, and, and I feel and, like that goes to your point, right? Mm -hmm. About the moment meeting you and yeah. the way that yes. telling stories shapes shapes what's happening next that you yes. are telling a story about your family and and all, all of these things kind of rush in to fill that space yes um, because there's demand and there's desire wow and i want to say i mean you know to any students still listening that the thing is i've had more not just not just um environmental organizations but in, in outdoor retailing businesses i'm working with a group from the un foundation who say who start off by saying you know, what they want is some engagement around race, diversity, equity, and the environment. But the reason, one of the reasons they're coming to me is because they like that I'm a storyteller. Mm -hmm. That's that telling story, which is something I think we do all the time, either intentionally or not. I think mm -hmm. even the most scientific document is a story, right? We extrapolate mm -hmm. in a very particular way and we help to create a narrative. And so people are really, there's something about this moment that people are, seem to be really attracted to this idea of story, not mm -hmm. as something that's anecdotal, but understanding that story invites, if we're talking about change, right, mm -hmm. how do you invite people into that change, right? You know, for me, it's not only supplying data, and data is important, and scientific data is important, mm -hmm. and, you know, Carl Sagan understood this, and I love me some Carl Sagan, right, that you had to, you have to you know, open it up so all kinds of people can figure out how their story, how they can come in and have a relationship with that story. And I'm sorry, you can get people to, you know, think about something, but until people feel something about what it is they're thinking, I don't necessarily believe they're going to change anything that they're doing. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. Sue and I were having this conversation before we came on. Yep. It, it's about, you know, different ways of knowing and how yes. you connect the lived experiences and the stories to the more scientific approach to knowing. Yes. And how, you know, somewhere between those two is the optimal path that we need to be following to move this, this movement Is forward. the actionable path, is, yeah. the, is the path we can act on, which is, yeah, I mean, ugh, I have too many things to say, but one of those, <laughs> things, one of the one sliver of those things is that I'm trained as a scientist and I know that what, and I wanted to ask you this and we didn't get into like, the sort of future of what what does this mean when we're trying to think about how how to integrate like you were saying not erase different stories not necessarily negate or find lies altogether but to integrate and truth stories by bringing in our our kind of erased or marginalized stories and how do we integrate those all well what do it we do with that in, exactly and then how do yeah. we then say those stories now now we're actually integrating them how do we move that into the future in a changing world because we're saying how do we make our stories um connected to the land and 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 understand nature in these broader contexts but also nature's changing right underneath us right and yeah. and doing so in different ways to different groups of people like what do we do with that <laughs> well and we're changing all the time, you know, we change it within our own bodies, we're changing all the time. So there's something about, for me, understanding how, how stories and the experience of change, it's fluid, you know, and as human beings, we often were comfortable thinking in 100 year increments, but really, if we thought in geologic time, hello, 10,000 years is just a drop in the bucket, right? So, you know, something about the way we, how do we get comfortable with change? Just how do we get and I mean, when I mean comfortable, I mean, just how do we get, we understand change is not something for us to necessarily be scared of, but we, I, you know, a long time ago when I was young, I took Aikido for a brief while. I love martial arts. I just think, you know, in another life, man, I want to be like, you know, Bruce Lee, Jet Lee. I'm all about that. Um, if you've ever seen the documentary Black Kung Fu, it's amazing about these Black Kung Fu dudes in the 70s. Anyway. I'll put um, this up. <laughs> uh, Black Kung Fu, right? It was on Black Kung Fu. Awesome. Right? And, uh, 
uh, when you, you study Aikido, the first thing you have to learn to do is to be grounded. And you, you learn how to, somebody comes at you, you know, for it to go by you without you losing your balance, right? You might have to learn how to fall and roll, but you ultimately no, never lose your center. And so for me, part of what that is about change is it doesn't mean you aren't open to being affected, but there's something about, that's for me, the intention. If you have an intention, the intention isn't something static. The intention is also something living. Like I, you know, I think this is what I want to do. And how I initially thought that that was going to appear, I soon discovered like that's not the way like it's going to go. So that means I got to come over here like this and revisit the intention, the visioning, you know, the dreaming. We often don't spend a lot of time visioning and dreaming. We go right to what we need to produce. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what we need to produce in parts can reflect how much time we didn't spend on vision and dreaming. So how do we make space for that, right, in the change? Well, well I could say, oh, my Lord. No. Yes. <laughs> um, I want to just say, I, I know we could go on and on, and we, we might, um, but we have amazing interpreters who have generously been oh, um, oh continuing. Yeah. So I want to acknowledge and thank um, Helen and Christine, I think, um, and mm -hmm. I... And, and also offer that, that we might end so that they can also take a break um, and yeah. go on to what they need to do next. So, Helena um, and Christine, thank you. I know I talk really fast <laughs> and I uh, so appreciate um, your making what I had to share available to so many more people. And so yeah. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank that's, you. That's how we need to be. So thank Yeah, it's so important. Thank you. Oof. Um, all right. I guess we should wrap and maybe I'll just, uh, just add myself to your email in your inbox. <laughs> we your definitely email. should do that. I would love that. We can have Zoom, you know, Zoom tea, Zoom wine, Zoom. We certainly yeah. could. <laughs> you know, I, all right. yes. That sounds perfect. Thank you again, Carolyn. I mean, Thank this you. was much anticipated, but I hope just an opening for us. Yes. It, it was, Thank it was you fabulous. Both. And I expect to see some more fabulousness when I come back. Like, you know, that, yeah. Oh, yeah. I am, I am now, now the, the bar has been set. I'm not going to show up not looking fly now. I'm like, oh, oh, that's what we're doing? Okay, okay. <laughs>